Thank you for packing into this room for the amazing Prodigy. Um, can we give him a big round of applause? The talk is moderated once again by uh, Professor Condry, who's an anthropology professor at MIT. Uh, wrote a book called Hip Hop Japan. He's an awesome guy. He's done this a bunch of times, so he knows what he's doing. And, uh, and then we've got Prodigy, who probably needs no introduction for you guys. So give it up and uh, enjoy the talk and ask some awesome questions. So by explaining like who I am a little something and uh, why I'm even interested in coming up here and talking kicking is uh, um my name is Prodigy, I got a rap group called Infamous Mall D and um, Yeah We came in the industry thank you we came in the industry when we were very young, we were about 15, 16 when we first got signed and came in into the game and started doing our thing and um yeah, so we were real young. We were like the ruffians, man, from the neighborhood. And um, I guess you would call us late bloomers. Because the other artists like, you know, Jay and Puff, they were a little older than us, you know. Uh, and they started independent companies. And we came in at a young age and we got signed to a, 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 a indie uh, a deal company called Loud Records. And um, yeah, so we were like, in the learning process. We were still learning who we are. We were still learning the business. We were learning like uh, how to be young men out in the world. And uh, we learned all of this being signed to this company and just putting out albums and touring the world. We had to learn how to become men and you know how to carry ourselves throughout all of that. And doing that, it was kind of difficult for us because like I said, we were young and we were from you know, uh, some bad parts of town, and uh, a lot of our friends was in the streets, and you know, it was just it was just rough making that transition from for us from the streets to you know having a, a real good job in the music industry and um, learning how to carry ourselves the right way, you know. And um, throughout that, doing all of that, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes, and I ended up getting locked up. And serving three and a half years in New York State Prison for having a illegal firearm in my car. And um, that kind of changed my life. I went to jail at 33. I was 30 years old, went to jail, and, and, and it's sad that it took me that long, you know, for, for me to get my life together and my decision making and my, my health and a bunch of other stuff like that I had to learn. And it's sad that I had to learn that in jail, but I did. and. It, um, that, that time in jail changed me a lot. It changed my perspective and the way I see things and the way I, you know, carry myself out here and, and just, just everything for me. It made me want to plan better for my future and, you know, make better decisions and, and things like that. So, you know, here I am now and, um, uh, what's up? What's up? <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Tell us what jail was like and, and how you got yourself together. All right, so, uh, yeah, be, being locked up for me was a little bit different because I have uh, sickle cell anemia, which is a hereditary blood disorder that you know passed down from the family, and um, you know, so being in in prison for me was difficult because of that. Number one, um, I have to eat right. I have to, you know, I have to drink a lot of water. I can't do strenuous exercise. Like uh, I can't do physical uh, contact sports and stuff like that. This, this is all the stuff the doctors told my family, you know, um, when I was a kid coming up. And so when I went to jail, that was the first thing that hit me big time. I was like, wow, I gotta be in here and uh, I get sick easy. Like, my, it, it triggers my pain. Now, if you don't know what sickle cell is, sickle cell is a, uh, it's a blood disorder where your red blood cells, um, they don't carry enough oxygen to your blood, to your body, excuse me. and. Um, Certain things can trigger it, like dehydration, um, uh, you know, my, my adrenaline, my heart start pumping, and I get overexcited, 
it triggered um, my blood cells to change shape. And they go from a round shape to like a crescent moon shape and they, they start locking in with each other and it causes clots. And, and it's like a domino effect. Wherever a clot starts, it spreads throughout the whole body and it just causes like super pain where I can't even move. I feel like my bones are broke and it's just crazy pain. So yeah, a few things that trigger my sickle cell. So one thing is being dehydrated. Another thing is uh, overworking my body where my adrenaline starts pumping and triggers my blood cells to change shape. And another thing is, uh, uh, you know, cold, the cold air. For some reason, it, it triggers my blood cells to change shape. So I gotta like stay hydrated. I gotta stay calm all the time. Try not to get too hyped. And I gotta, uh, you know, um, stay warm in, in, in the cold weather. So being you know, knowing all of that and being in jail, it's like, it's it's hard to do those things. <clears throat> because, number one, the food in there is like crazy, it's like slop, you know what I mean? It's disgusting. <laughs> so, I had to eat, I had to learn that I could control my sickle cell through diet. You know, I started learning that right before I went to jail. So, I kind of knew some things. And um, being in there, I started really, pra really putting it into practice, like, you know, um, Prisoners in jail, they're allowed to get 35 pounds a month from their family of food once a month. Like, so you can get like whatever, snacks, whatever you want from the you know, streets. As long as it's allowed in the prison, you're allowed to get 35 pounds of it once a month. So I would tell my wife, send me 35 pounds of canned green vegetables. And that's all I would get every month. And other inmates would look at me like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, I gotta survive, I gotta do this. Like, I'm training myself. So I would get that, and that helped, that helped to keep the sickle cell under control, you know? And I would drink nothing but water every day. And then once I got to the point where I felt like my diet was strong and it made my body a little strong, I started testing myself for working out. And, um, you know, that was a whole other thing, because like I said, I'm not supposed to do no contact or, you know, sports and, and over-exert my body. So I had to learn how to work out with my sickle cell, because really I'm not supposed to be working out. So I had to actually learn my body and what I can do, how much my body can take. And, um, you know, I learned how to do it. I just have to do it at a slower pace than everybody else in the gym. I got to work slow. I got to take longer breaks in between reps. I got to, I mean, in between sets. And I got to... Um, you know, just pace myself. While everybody's moving faster, get their workout done in an hour, it takes me two, three hours to get my entire workout done. You know what I mean? So I had to learn that. It was a learning process, just learning how much my body can take and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so that's that's the stuff that was going through my mind and everything I was going through in jail was just learning that part first. It was about my health and um, taking care of that. And then like the second part was, you know, um, just. <coughs> reading a lot and learning how to um, expand my mind and think a little differently, learning how to um, communicate with other people, you know, being social with other people that's in there, you know, because I went in there with the mindset, like, come on, this, you in prison, I don't want to be friends with none of these people in here, like, they criminals, you know, but yeah, that's really not necessarily true. There's some good people within jail, you know, they just got caught up in bad situations. So, you know, just dealing with other people and prison made me learn how to, you know, communicate with and socialize with other people better and, um, you know, learning that skill a little more because I didn't really have too much of that, like, coming up. We had a little small circle of people and everybody else was like, whatever, F you. I don't even care about you, like, you know? And um, that was the wrong attitude to have, you know what I mean? Because that kind of attitude will hinder, you know, and, and stymie everything for you, you know? I mean, that's what I, my sense of what I imagine people in prison, that there's a lot of smart people with a lot of capability who got caught up in bad things, maybe made a bad, made a mistake, right. but they got a lot going for them and what a waste of human value. And, and I'm wondering, you know, having been in prison, you know, what could be done better to help that population? And, you know, you managed to do it. You managed to get that motivation and other ways that could be made easier for other people. Right. Uh, and I'm just trying to get a sense of what it's like, because it must be people who would also benefit. Yeah, definitely. Um, being in there, you know, a lot of people were learning from me also, like about the diet. Like, they were like, why are you eating like this? Like, what are you doing? Like, so I was teaching people, like, yo, listen, this is how you got to eat. Boom, boom, not just for me, but this is how everybody should be eating, to tell you the truth. 
But um, my diet affects me faster than it's gonna affect you. Like your diet, you know, uh, a, a normal healthy person's diet, um, if you have a bad diet, it'll affect you four years later. You know, for me, if I have a bad diet, it'll affect me three days later. You know, my body will react to it, like instantly, if I'm not eating right. So to me, it's like having sickle cell is like having an alarm system on my body. Like it tells me I'm something ain't, I'm doing something wrong. You know, and, and it's time to fix it. So that's how I started looking at it. It's like it's, it's more, it's more of a, a blessing than a curse. That's how I started looking at it. And um, you know, just being in prison, talking with other people about diet and stuff like that. I seen that I was actually helping other people. You know, and they started learning more about diet and stuff like that. And um, the things that I would learn from other inmates, like I said, how to socialize and be more, you know, uh, communicate better with other people. And um, sometimes. Uh, it was this young kid I was like a, uh, we call him Fresh, right? He was maybe about 20 or something like that. So he was about 10 years younger than me, something like that, whatever it was. And um, his favorite thing to do on Friday was watch 106 and Park on BET. Right? It was a you know, hip-hop show that comes on on BET. Um, it doesn't come on anymore. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that was his favorite thing to do. And there's about, in the dorm, there's about 30 of us in the dorm. So on Fridays, he would make everybody watch 106 and Park. Even if nobody else wanted to watch, he'd be like, no, we watching 106 and Park. It's Friday, we're watching it. So, you know, I, I'm not a really big TV guy. Like, I don't really watch TV that much, even when I was home. So this is my first time actually watching TV on a regular basis. Like, you know, it's right there. There's really nothing else to do. So I used to sit there and watch 106 and Park with him. And the videos that would come on, I would always be like, ah, oh, this is corny, man. <laughs> like this, yo? You like this? I'm like, yo, why are you giving these rappers a hard time? Yo, give them a chance, Pete. Like, give them a chance to try to do it right then with his life, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it made, me, it made me look at myself different. Like, yo, word, why am I doing that? <laughs> I gotta stop it. That's not cool, like, you know what I'm saying? So it made me look at myself different. Because before I had went to jail, I was having all these opinions about rappers. Like, oh, he's garbage. He trans, I don't like this one, I don't like that one. Because that's how hip hop is, it's like real competitive, like, you know what I mean? So, it's like, uh, we had like bad opinions about each other, or we'll be real vocal about each other, you know, sometimes. And it's just like a battle thing, competition thing. But um, I had to learn how to not do that, because it, it, it becomes redundant, it becomes crazy, and you get locked into this mentality where you end up being stuck, be this old bitter person about, Every, all these new artists, like, I don't even want to be like that. So lear I learned that from being around him, just how to, you know, just be more, you know, um, accept, like, you know, accept people more. Like, give them a chance. Get to do a chance. Who is this artist? Where he from? Like, look, at least he's not selling drugs. He's trying to rap. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it made me look at things like that. So that, that changed me a lot. Yeah. You know, because that was a big issue with me. Like, starting beefs with other rappers and stuff like that. It made me look at myself different. So. I walked away with that, you know, difference in myself and that change in myself because of him watching 106 and Park. Like, you know, <laughs> were you able to do any music when you were in prison? Uh, I was able to write a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, it is no studio or nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> in a particular jail that I was in, but some jail do have uh, studio setups and stuff like that, like music rooms and. They got like bands and stuff like that in the church and stuff like that. But um, in the particular job I was in, nah, there wasn't any studio, so I wasn't able to record anything, but I wrote every single day. Like I actually, when I learned that I had to actually serve this time in prison and then the reality hit me, I was like, all right, I'm going to jail. I had to explain to my kids. You know, I got a 16-year-old daughter and 19-year-old son now, but back then, you know, that she was probably like nine, ten, you know, and they were younger then. And um, I had to sit them down and explain to them, like, listen, I gotta go away for a little while. I gotta do three years. This is why I gotta do three years. I had a gun in my car. I wasn't supposed to have a gun. It was a legal firearm. And I explained to them everything because I always tell my kids the truth. I want them to, you know, have proper mind state and know what's going on in reality. So after doing that. I actually, you know, I sat down with myself and my own thoughts, and I'm like, all right, if I gotta go to jail for three and a half years, I'm gonna use this time to improve myself. You know what I mean? I'm gonna use this time to get strong. 
I'm gonna use this time to, you know, learn more about myself, uh, make myself stronger through diet, make myself, um, a, 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 make myself a better person. Just, you know, a more enjoyable person for other people, <laughs> like, you know, um, and that's it, really. Like, I went in there with that mind state. I went in there, like, this is my plan, and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get my GED, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do that. And I actually went in there and did it. Wow. You know what I mean? So a lot of people, they don't go to jail with those plans in their head. They're just angry when they get in jail. Um, like my young friend Fresh that I met in jail, who used to watch BET all the time. He was one of those, he's real young, so he was angry. He was like, yo, these CEOs is racist. I don't like none of these CEOs, man. F this one, F that one. I don't like being here. And I used to have to talk to him like, yo, dog, like, chill. Like, they're going to act like that. But when you know you carry yourself with respect, showing respect, and it's all good. They're not, they won't mess with you. You know what I mean? And it took him time to understand that. Mm -hmm. And then he started learning, like, oh, well, you're right. The CEOs are not that bad. Like, you know, because um, I, I had learned, like, when the CEOs first meet you in there, they first attitude about all the inmates in prison is just like you, just like everybody else. You just a criminal, just like everybody else. And I gotta come here for a few hours, do my job, and keep my eye on you and watch you. And so. But with dealing with me, it was like I was, you know, celebrity going into jail. So a lot of the CEOs, they would come up to me and pull me to the side, like, oh, I was watching your video last night. <laughs> <laughs> I like that song that you got with uh, so and so, and what you were saying on the song with, with this, that, and the third. And I was like, took in the back, like, shocked, like, wow, you was watching, you was watching YouTube last night? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't saying nothing that offends you then, like, you know? <laughs> But it made me realize, it actually made me realize, like, you know, all the CEOs ain't bad. They just got that attitude, you know, in their mind because they come, this is their job, they're in prison every day, dealing with these prisoners. So they already come in with a bad attitude most of the time, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's just like a, a, a facade that most of them put up, you know, to protect their own self, too. Because a lot of these, they're criminals. The criminals are sneaky, you know what I mean? They'll do, they'll do some conniving stuff to you, like, so... They gotta put up that wall, you know what I mean, to protect themselves. So that's I had learned that a lot of the CEOs is not as bad as they say they are. As long as you carry yourself with respect, talk to them with respect, you know, that wall comes down after a while. You know, and then they start learning you and you start having conversations with them. It's not all that bad. It's interesting. Can you talk a little bit about dealing with the justice system before prison and that process? And I mean I mean it is a situation that we have so many People in prison, especially men, especially black men, 2.2 million people America has in prison. 22% of the global population of prisoners is a, it's a real crisis right now. And 40% of the people we have in prison right now are, are black Americans. Right. And, uh, and so it makes us wonder you know, what's going on with the criminal justice system. Um, and I'm just curious about your own personal experience and, and I guess of what you learned from other people who are also in the situation. Well, um, I had already started like learning about the world and like you know race relations, politics, and you know health and all this stuff before I went to prison. I, this is actually things I'm interested in, like um, the history of things and the origin of things, like how this got started. How, you know who was the first one to do this and that and the third. So throughout my studies and learning and reading books and stuff like that, um, you know I learned that uh, you know. Um, the, the prison system is basically a business right now. It's like a major, major, big time business. It's an industry. It's, you know, people are making money off of this thing. So, um, a lot of a lot of the prison population it has to do with race. It is a racial issue. You know what I mean? But it, it's also a business issue. That's right. People are making money. That's right. You know, um, I think the racial issue is getting better as time goes by, but this business issue and this money issue, I don't see it getting better. Mm -hmm. They trying to make, they don't care what color you are, they want they, they want you to fill these jails, you know. And from what I learned also um, about the prison industry is that it's easier to lock up, you know, these drug offenders in the hoods, in the bad neighborhoods, you know what I mean? Um, they, you know, they make those crack laws, you know, where one gram of crack is equivalent to whatever grams of cocaine. Yeah, so you get caught with a little piece of crack and you're going to, you're getting mandatory, 
minimum sentence is, you get sent away for a long time. Compared to somebody get caught with a key of cocaine or something like that, it's like, or, or a rapist, or, you know, uh, commit some other crazy crime, they're getting less time than a little minor drug dealer or something like that. So I learned that that was probably done on purpose, you know, because it's easier to get to fill up those jails with these little crimes that it's easier to catch than to go into, like, the uh, suburban neighborhoods, you know what I mean, where it's more white people living or whatever, and and it's it's easier for them to get out. They got big time lawyers or, you know, it's just easier to go into the hoods and catch these kids on the street, yeah. little crack in their pockets, catch the addicts on the street. It's just, it's a faster way to make the money. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It keeps the system rolling faster. So that's what, that's really the problem. Yeah. That's most of the problem, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, and then you know, a lot of a lot of people, you know, they they're angry. You know, people are angry. You know, in, in those neighborhoods, in black neighborhoods, in the Latino communities, like they're fed up, they're angry. So you know, and um, with a lot of the police shootings and a lot of the incarceration rates and people doing crazy time for, you know, these these simple things. Um, even though drugs is nothing simple or. or it's a bad crime, like, you know what I mean? But it's still, it's, it's, um, it's disproportionate, like, you know, the laws and, and, and the way the prison system is set up, you know what I mean? And that people are angry. So you see people, like, you know, creating things like Black Lives Matter and out there protesting, and it just explodes. Yeah. Um, but uh, also, I learned that, you know, just, just from, from my own experiences, dealing with my own changes in my life, I learned that, you know, um, it has a lot to do with, you know, the family also, and just your own attitude. Because a lot of times people create their own problems, you know what I mean? Like, you got a bad attitude, you're having a bad day, you, you mouth off to a cop, it escalates the situation, now you put yourself in a crazy situation. Or you mouth off with somebody out in the world, and you know, they got a gun on them now, you just escalate the situation, just because of your attitude alone. So I had to, I had to learn for myself how to, change my attitude and you create a better outcome for my life. You know what I mean? And I see that's a problem in the world. Like a lot of these young kids, they got bad attitudes. And I and I can relate because 'cause I've been there before, you know what I mean? But um And they got reason to be frustrated, feel yeah, put yeah. upon and not getting access to all sorts of things. Yeah, like, look around and you'll see who's got access. Yeah, they do. They do have a good reason and, and like I said, they explode after a while. But um I believe that, you know, having a good family structure you know, my father wasn't around when I was a kid. He was in jail. He was a drug addict. Um, he died at a young age, you know what I mean, from AIDS. He was sharing needles. He was a heroin addict, and he died of AIDS, you know what I mean? And by the time I was like 18, 19, he was gone, you know? And for the rest of the time when I was growing up, he was in jail, you know? Um, so I think that definitely affected me and my guidance and my attitude and everything. My mother, you know, she's a female, she's a real nice person, positive lady. She couldn't control my rage that was inside of me, and she was probably scared of me, like, you know what I mean? So, um, I think a lot of it has to do with just, like, family structure, what your family teaches you in the house, your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your father, and all of that affects a young kid's attitude and how they carry themselves and conduct themselves in the world, you know? That's a, that's a big problem. You know, because I, I, I see my, my own son is 19 right now, and he has this bad attitude. I'm like, where did this come from? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I try to tell him, like, yo, you got to chill. Like, certain things you can't do, you're going to create your own issues out here, man. And then you can avoid that just by treating people with respect, being mindful of other people's feelings, being mindful of other people around you. Just, you know, watch yourself. Fix your attitude. Put your attitude in check, and your life will be much better, you know? It's an amazing story. Tell us about after prison and, and your, what you've been doing since then. I mean, you, you've been really active, you've been touring. Uh, I know some of it's been a challenge, but tell us about that process and what it's been like for you. All right, so um, on, when I was on my way home, when I was like at the end of my sentence and uh, it was getting closer for me to go home, I started realizing that when I get home, I could jump right back into the music industry. And when some of my friends or associates or whatever you want to call them, the people that I met in jail, when they get home, 
They can't do the same thing that I do. They're gonna have a hard time getting a job. You know, they got a felony on their record. No one's gonna hire them. Can't get no public assistance. They got laws that say you can't have welfare and stuff like that when you have a felony. Um, you know, so it's like on their record forever and it, it's like almost destroys their life, you know, in a way. It does destroy their life, you know. And um, I learned that and the reality hit me like, wow, like, all right, I'm going home, be all right. And my man next to me here, he's stressed out. Like, where's he going to live? What, what's he going to do for a living? How's he going to make money and all this stuff? So, um, you know, I, I never really got stressed about myself when I got home. And um, they told me I couldn't travel. Right. I couldn't travel overseas. My traveling was restricted in the U.S. Because that's where the bulk of our money comes from in hip hop. It's from us touring and doing shows all over the U.S. and overseas. And um, when I got home, I was on parole. I had parole for three years, and my parole officer was like, "No, nah, you can't, you can't go overseas. You can't use your passport at all, and your travel is restricted in the U.S. So you have to tell me what shows you're doing, and I'll tell you what you can't do and what you can do." Like, yeah, you can do this show now. Nah, you're going to have to miss this one. You're going to have to miss this How one. How do they decide that? It's so they own discretion. Uh, wow. You know what I mean? Like, it's up to them, really. You know? Um, so basically, I had to, you know, think about that and be like, damn, well, at least I'm lucky I'm able to do anything. You know what I mean? Because some people come on, they can't do nothing. They're stuck. So that's like a big problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like, um, they need to have, I think they, need, they should have more uh, programs with, you know, people transitioning That's from reintegration, yeah. yeah, coming home from prison to back into the world, and um, you know, I, and, but but once again, I think that also people should uh, you know, plan a little bit ahead. Why why are you in jail? Like you have to plan, like way ahead of time. Where are you gonna stay? Somebody hook you up with a job. Maybe why you in jail? Learn a skill just from reading. The skill that you can learn just from reading. Like you know, learn something so you can actually have something to come home to. And, you know, but um, as far as, like, from, from, uh, from the government side, I think they should have more programs right. and create more programs for that transition when people come home and, like, people can have jobs and, and not go back to jail. Right, give the people know? a chance, right. Yeah. They got talent. They, they, definitely, too, they right. definitely need to do more of that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your long career in music. I mean, you've seen huge changes in the music industry from heyday of the CD era and big labels, uh, and now today where it's about touring and it's about other kinds of things. Can you tell us how you've experienced those changes and, and a little bit about how you see the future maybe developing? Yeah, uh, well, coming up in the industry, like I said, we were like 15, 16. This was like 91, 90 when we were just learning the business and, you know, having meetings with these companies and fi figuring out which company we're going to run with and what was best for us and all that. And um, yeah, we seen major changes, man, major changes. It was like, back then in the early 90s, it was like big budgets for everything and all these elaborate videos and stuff like that. And um, you know, we seen technology change. Like we went from two inch reels that we were recording on in these big studios to now we, we had Pro Tools. You know, like we were the, one of the first groups to actually use Pro Tools, right. you know, um, back when they first came out, like, you know, 96, 97 or something like that. And, um, yeah, we had started using the Pro Tools and just learning how to transition from that. And then the internet came. Because when we first came in the game, it wasn't no internet. You know what I mean? It was barely cell phones. Like, cell phones had just started coming out, like, you know. And, um, so now this big transition happened with the internet, and digital music, and digital downloads, and it was like affecting the sales. And it was just like, wow, man, you know, um, what do you do? So it makes you angry at first. I bet. You know what I mean? It makes you angry at first. Like, all right, how are we going to eat? How are we going to make this money? These companies, these downloads, people getting our music for free. But then, you know, your you, you, thinking mind has to really kick in. Like, all right, how could you go along with technology and still win at the same time, you have to learn how to adapt. Like, you know, you have to, you have no choice. Like, you have to adapt. So, you know, what we did, what we started doing is, like, you just know what? It's more important just to create the music, create the music, create the music. This is the music industry, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Create the music, make great music, and everything else is going to fall into place 
no matter what happens with technology, no matter what happens, everything will fall into place. Just as long as you stay focused, as long as we stay focused on creating great content, great music, you know, and um, it worked for us, you know what I mean? We, we try not to think. It's almost like, oh man, I'm complaining about this and do that. Just focus on music and everything will fall into place. Focus on music and, and building a strong network of people, like, you know? Uh, What's the key to making great music for you guys? Um, for us, what worked for us was sticking to our sound, not um, going with the times as far as sound, like as far as our particular sound of music, because we created a sound back in like, you know, 95 when we put out the Infinite Side, and we had created this like, this real dark, sinister hip hop sound that's like, you know, people know us for. That was our brand, like, you know, and um, we found out just by sticking with that, we had loyal, we created a loyal fan base, you know, and we created a genre of music almost like that, you know, that was specialized just for us, like, so we stuck with it. And no matter what was, trends was coming, no matter who was popular, doing this style of music, doing that style of music, we was like, you know what, we stick to this. And it just works, it works, because we always look, we always say like Coca-Cola. You know what I mean? I think they formula. Sometimes they might do like, you know, Diet Coke or like Cherry Coke or something like that. You know, and the same thing for us. Sometimes we'll play with some sounds here on the album. We'll make a song with 112, a little R&B, mix with Mom D. Yeah. But the bulk of the album is we stick to our formula, you know, and, and it works. And that's and that goes for any brand, I think. Once you become like a known brand and, and people trust your brand, you gotta stick with it. You can't change up on these people, man. They're gonna be angry, you know what I mean? <laughs> Give the people what they want. Yeah, man. <laughs> we have a room full of MIT and, and other people, uh, but some technologists <laughs> here as well. Uh, nothing, yes. wrong, nothing wrong with not being from MIT. It's uh, amazing, bro. Me to be here talking with y'all, I feel so blessed. Like, this is a, I heard so much about this school. This is a hell thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a mutual feeling, you know, it's a big deal to have you here, it, it, it makes MIT much cooler. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool, but now it's cool. <laughs> but the question, so here's a question, uh, is, so technology, people say technology is changing the world. Is there a technology you wish people would invent or, or develop further that uh, you think might move things in exciting directions? I'm going to tell you something interesting, right? My father, even though he was like this menace, crazy guy, uh, my father was like one of the first people to like use computers and like create, write programs and, and stuff like that. He actually was one of the... Um, he might have been the first, him and a couple other people, to test out Windows for Bill Gates and uh, to test the system, like, because he was like one of the top people in his field. And right when he died, he was working for IBM, you know, and he, his job, he was like setting up computer systems and, and college classrooms. He would set up the whole system and troubleshoot and, and do, uh, you know, tech services for them afterwards and, and all that. And um, so when I was a kid, I'm talking about in the 80s, when I was a little kid, my pops used to be in the living room writing programs. I didn't know what the hell he was doing. I'm like, what is this? Like, he's trying to show me how to do it. It was just like a foreign language. Like, I, I didn't understand it. I was too young. But now, you know, thinking back about it, I wish my father was still here because he would be so, so far advanced and, and have so much knowledge and, and things he could teach me about that stuff. You know what I mean? Um, so it was always... You know, um, not always, but as I got older and I miss my pops a lot, it always brings me back like, damn, like it's so interesting to me, you know, with, 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 with technology and like, um, you know, writing programs and just seeing him, all the stuff he was doing, like it's, it's so interesting to me. Like, so when I think about that, that question you asked me, like what would, what would be like a technology? Yeah, uh, something, yeah, we should develop. Some type like, of what kind of, yeah, what should we do? I don't know, like to me, I like, I like, I think that like a lot of surveillance now, right? The surveillance now is stopping a lot of corruption. You know, um, there's a lot of camera phones, a lot of things getting caught on tape now. Talk about body cameras for the police, you yeah. know, and, and that's part that's of the Black Lives thing too. You can see it. I came with an idea, right? One day, I don't know. Probably not a new idea, right? 
But I was just thinking, just <coughs> freestyle thinking, right? I was like, what if cops had like a camera on their gun? As soon as you pick up the gun, the camera turns on with with a microphone and everything. So you could see exactly why they pulling their gun and hear exactly what was going on. That was a thought. You know what I mean? That's not bad. Like as soon as they grip the gun. You a brain scan going on too. slang right in the street when people when they see somebody's crazy they're like oh, you 730 and I learned from being locked up that that's where that slang comes from because at 730 a.m. they come around with the meds for everybody and then at 730 p.m. they come around from the, with the second meds for everybody so it's like that's where everybody gets psych medicine if you have any kind of medical issues you get your medicine at 730 and um it was like seeing that it just it, it showed me how many people needed medication, whether it be psych medicine or medic medication like me. I, I had to take pain medicine when I was in there. They had to give it to me twice a day. And, um, and actually, I didn't even need the pain medicine. I only need my pain medicine when my pain is actually happening. But the way I set my case up with my lawyer, we made sure that they were giving it to me twice a day so I wouldn't have no issues in there about getting it when it was time for me to get it. But um, yeah, I seen that they were definitely, that was definitely a thing that they, 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 they took care of in there. You know, people definitely get their medication. They're like, they don't play with that. Because they don't want a lawsuit and stuff like that to happen. Do they offer any counseling? Yeah, they had counseling. They had counselors that come around and talk to people. And, um, you know, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, if you needed to talk to somebody, they would actually, you know, you could tell them. And they would actually call the counselor and, you know, like, make a little appointment or whatever. And they'll come talk to you at your cell or whatever or bring it to their office. Yeah, that's, yeah, oh here, please, yes. Going back to what, what, what Prodigy was saying about uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the time of the recording of the infamous, and you know, people, you know, in the, in the hood, wild, and wherever you are, um, 1995 is when uh, the Violent Crime Act omnibus passed. So, during that same time while you re were recording the album, um, in about September of 95, um, Congress made it sh so that 100,000 more police were in the streets across America. That $6 billion went into to policing our community. <coughs> and the bulk of, 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 uh, of those funds and those police went to places like where you're from, from Hempstead or Queensbridge, mm -hmm. right? So. <coughs> Just it's a challenge to think more about the policies because it's not a mistake. Like you're on to it, on to the right thing. It's not a mistake at all. But the business model is expanding. And the only way that that turns around is that the most important voices start to, to speak up. And the art is where it works. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's another, definitely something important that I learned. While being locked up, I, I tried to um, teach myself more about, you know, and getting into politics more and uh, how we can actually make changes, how, how I, I can actually make changes in my immediate world, you know what I mean? And the things that I can do is, uh, like, before I, got, before I got locked up, I used to be real vocal about, like, you know, like, uh, conspiracies and just different things like that. I still am, but I would, I would like really be vocal and I didn't trust the government. I didn't trust presidents, politics. I didn't trust none of these people I, because, you know, my trust was broken with them. You know what I mean? And it felt like it was, you can't fix it. You know what I mean? It's just broke. I don't believe nothing you got to say. I didn't believe religion. I didn't believe none of these books that, you know what I mean, that they tried to push on us. And I tried to fix that about myself. I tried to learn more about politics and the importance of it and 
just learning to respect people's opinion more and just how can, how can we fix this in a more positive direction instead of just being so, having so much rage about it? How can I calm myself down, learn more about it, and learn the steps that I need to take, you know, to try and better my, my world, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what I learned is that, you know, um, it's, it's, it's real important to vote and, you know what I mean, especially for like senators, congressmen, and pay attention to like when they got these bills, you know, and these laws, you have to really pay attention and, you know, it's up to the people, man, to, to, to really be involved and pay attention to that type of stuff because, you know, the government works for us, they work for us, you know, and I had to learn that. And it took me a long time to learn that because I was so angry throughout the years of me coming up and I didn't really have to be out here in the system, like, you know, working nine to five. I had my job, I was making a lot of money, I was on the road, you know what I mean? I had my own little world. So I didn't really care about certain politics and what the newspaper had to say and all that. It didn't really, it just felt like it didn't affect me, you know what I mean? And I learned that it's, that's not true. You know, it's not true and, I, and that I wanted to put the right message out there to people because I might have put the wrong message out there before where, you know, I was being real ignorant. Um, my name is Jordy. Um, so there's kind of like a lot of conversation about uh, like from an individual perspective versus like a systematic institutional perspective. And um, I, I want to be clear on your standpoint um, because you mentioned there is a, there's a case that people um, that are in the prison population, they do have this attitude um, that comes from their environment um, that may lead them to be, you know, to get into prison. Then you mentioned how their attitudes in prison may lead them to get a certain type of treatment. Then you mentioned how their attitudes after prison could be the reason why they either can succeed or they fall back into this trap. But I'm not hearing too much about where you think more effort needs to put in on the individual's behalf or like this gentleman said, on more from the policy, governmental institutions actually just being, um, you know, racially, uh, you know, racially just unequal. Right, and just, it's like, it's both. It's both. It has to come. It has to come from both ends. Like you know, it definitely be, it needs to be a lot of reform and changes with uh, you know the criminal justice system and the way the whole system is set up. But it also, be it needs to be a lot of changes with people's attitudes, man, and like the way they were brought up and the way they treat each other amongst their friends. Like people attitude, man, it gets you in a lot of bad situations or good situations, depending on how you carry yourself. And that's a big thing for me when I learn and when I look at people and when I see things happening in the world, man. It was, a lot of it is people's attitude, man. They got the wrong attitude about life, you know. And um, it's sad that, you know, life can give you this attitude, like the way the system is set up can give people this attitude. You know, it gives you, it gives you a bad attitude, make you angry, you know. But um, you got to be smart about it and just know that it takes, it's a slow process for the actual criminal justice system to change and for, for laws to change and, you know, the way the politics and the government is set up, it takes time for all of that to change because there's a lot of old people that used to run things that just need to actually die off. I was brought up old, old Southern black lady, like my attitude had to be on point, right? So like on a personal level, you know, like I was in check, you know, but I also grew up in Academy Homes in Roxbury. Um, and so I didn't always ask for, you know, police discrimination or um, to be arrested or to get in these situations that I ended up in. Granted, like, I, I thank God, like I, I made it through to somebody's institution and, and came out with a degree, right? But. Um, it's not always about the attitude either. You know, I can have a smile on my face and still get pent up for no reason. Um, and so there's a reason why, like, uh, like for me, I, I personally think there's a reason why um, that happens. And part of it is like blackness is a threat to something, right? To what? I don't know. I do know, but we're not going to speak about that right now. Um, and, and so I think a lot of what happens is that people police, yo, people police that based on like what they perceive to be a threat. So that's one part of it that I just want to say in conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And the other question that I had is, as a hip-hop head, as somebody who's, who's grown up there 
Um, and somebody who's in education, like I have my kids all the time that want to be you. Hell, I want to be you sometimes, right? Um, what is, do you think that um, hip hop has a moral obligation to advance um, black folks, black and brown bodies? Um, because historically it started as a tool to, to you know, create voices and to create a platform um, and a movement, and it did that, and it and it does that. It still is losing sight of it sometimes. Like pe folks like you, or why that happened. And so, do you think uh, hip hop has a moral obligation to do that, or do you think hip hop only has an obligation to make art? Because I believe that sometimes too um, has an obligation to make art, um, and hopefully people see something in you that makes them want to be better, no matter if it's about <coughs> the race or not, or uh, you know what's right. I'm sorry, that was a lot, but. No, <laughs> Yeah, I think um, for the second part of the question, I think um, second part of what you were saying <coughs> that hip hop is definitely an art first, right. you know, and then you're gonna have different styles of art. You know, you're gonna have the, the party style, you're gonna have the more intellectual style, you're gonna have, you know, this is different. It's different tastes, different genres actually in hip hop. Um, everybody doesn't do the same thing, um, and. Um, through, through that being so, you're gonna have artists that are more, you know, politically inclined, just socially in, um, involved in a way, and, and and making their art like that. And it's, that's always gonna be there. That'll never go away. It's just you gotta find it, you know, because it's it's so much in hip hop right now, and you can get lost in it. Like you gotta run a comb through the entire hip hop and find good stuff. Like so, but it's there. Actually, it's there. And, um, you know, you just got to find it, man. You know, artists like from back in the days that I grew up listening to, like uh, Public Enemy, Carewish, Carewish One, Rock Kim, and um, different artists like that uh, shaped and molded the person that I am as an artist, you know. Um, and not just them, but even N.W.A. with their anger and rage and all of that. I feel like I'm a mixture of all of that, like, you know, and uh, I, have, I have different styles of hip-hop that come out of me alone. Like I don't, I don't like to pigeonhole myself or put myself in a box and make one particular sound. I like to play around with the sounds and colors and like it's like real art to me. So sometimes I'll make a song like this or I'll make one more like this, you know. Um, but it's always there. But I don't think that it's like an obligation. Like you have to do this. You have to teach people. Like nah, this is art, man. Do the art how you want to do it. And if it comes out good, comes out bad, whatever, that's your art. That was, that was your chance to do what you had to do and show it to the world. You know what I mean? Right. Hey. Um, for the first part of what you were saying, though, yeah, I understand what you mean. That's why I was like, yeah, yeah. it's about that, um, you know, the world, the way the world is set up, and politics and the government and just racial issues with people, it creates serious anger and rage, man. It, it, that's, that's real, and it, and it creates that attitude problem. You know what I mean? But, um... Yeah, it's not just, it, I'm not just, I, don't ever get me confused with saying it's just an attitude problem. Because yeah, it's not, you know, because it's something that created that attitude also. But some people just do have bad attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, nothing had to create it. They're just a bad person. Like, they, they don't adjust themselves. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. It, it, it reminds me, and it is, it's an interesting debate. It's a long time debate about, you know, structural problems versus what we can do as individuals. And I was a little off topic, but I remember years ago seeing the Dalai Lama. He was going to talk about compassion and world politics. And he got us, great, let's work, break it down country by country, nationalism, laws, different governments. And he got up there for about an hour, he said, don't get angry. And that was his one thing, over and over. And, and it was, everybody was frustrated, and like, yeah, but what about terrorism? What about the nuclear arsenal? And he said, don't get angry. Uh, and it was really, it, it was, everybody was really frustrated. They called him really naive. They said he doesn't understand the structural, you know, challenges we face. But... Over the years, you know, it, it got more and more interesting to me. And, and I think that it is something that when we talk about the structures, the structures are there. They're for real, right? And it, it's black bodies are in danger. They get shot all the time, locked up, poor schools, hard to get housing. All that's real and true and structural, regardless of people's attitudes. I understand that frustration, too. But it, what it reminds me also is that in our desire to have somebody in front of us, somebody with a bigger name, somebody with a bigger soapbox than us, the, in a way, it's, it's maybe too much for us to ask that that person do everything for us. You know, that they're going to 
they're going to be able to help in ways, but we got to come along behind too with the data, with the history, with the other experiences. And so, so anyway, that's the way where I come, you know, I, I hear the frustration, but also thinking, you know, some of this is on us, you know, to keep building all around the edges too. And, uh, and, and then part of it is our own attitude. I mean, that's one aspect of our own attitude developing too. So it is kind of inspirational to me. Yeah, it's true. It's like, it's, there's many parts to this, like, you know, and it always starts with, Hit with yourself, you know what I mean. It always starts here first, cause you can't do nothing right if you if you're not correct yourself and and carrying yourself correctly, like right? you know. Yeah, we got one here, and then I thought there's one. Yeah, go ahead. You're up. Yeah. My name's Chandler, and earlier you were talking about how incarceration damages families, breaks them apart. Was, was there anything during your experience that you mind sharing with us that, about how your own incarceration affected your family? Yeah, definitely. Uh, me. Being locked up for three and a half years, like that affected my family a lot. Like, you know, my, my daughter started acting up, you know, being more wild, because I'm not there. My son started acting more wild. Uh, it affected my my group, Mob Deep. You know, <coughs> um, we weren't able to do things while I was locked up, so it was like a quiet time for our brand. Um, you know, frustration for my partner Havoc, you know, because he wasn't able to really be out there active, making the money that we were making when we were together and I was home. Um, yeah, it's like, it, it, it's, it affects everything around, you know, the person being locked up, man. Um, but especially the, the kids, is like bad, man, because, you know, you, you lose that contact, that bond, and making sure that, you know, they're doing the right thing and they ain't checked. Because, you know, you know, when the father's in the house and the mother's in the house watching them, they, they're not so quick to do something bad, like, you know, and when I'm not around, you might sneak out or try some drugs or anything, man, you know, it's just bad because they feel like, you know, they need to act out or they might, they probably be angry, so they're going to act out or they feel like they can get away with things because you're not around, like, you know, so, man, it's, it affected my family a lot in that way, you know, it affected my relationship with my wife, like, you know what I mean, um, we were gone away from each other for a long time, so, man, it had a big effect. Had a big effect on us. <clears throat> yeah, this one over here. Do you have any thoughts about how or why so many great artists were able to come out during that period when you guys, you oh, know, okay, okay. in the 90s? Yeah. Like, what inspired well, that? Well, okay, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it had a lot to do with definitely our neighborhood and, um, you know, just our particular circumstances, me and daughter <coughs> Happy. And, uh, and um, you know, just. For myself, it was like growing up with sickle cell, growing up with that pain, you know, um, since I was born. Um, it definitely had like some, I had like some mental issues going on, just being in the hospital by myself for weeks and weeks at a time and almost, you know, feeling like I'm about to die sometimes and being close to death sometimes. It kind of affected me definitely like how, you know, um, the style of music that I was into. Cause when I was a little kid and I first heard hip hop, that's what attracted me to it was like this aggressiveness. Cause I was an angry kid and going through what I was going through. So the first thing that attracted me to it was it was so aggressive, and it was a way that I can get my anger out and just be aggressive too. So you know um, that helped shape our sound a lot. You know from me going through that, and then also the neighborhoods that we came up in. You know um, you know our friends in the neighborhood like. Uh, Queensbridge and Queens and, and where I'm from, where I was born and raised in Hempstead, Long Island, it's like those are rough neighborhoods, like, and, um, you know, a lot of our friends, they were into a lot of stuff, and a lot of our friends wouldn't let us do certain things, like the older dude, the older dude, they were like, nah, you're not selling drugs, go back in the studio, yo, you know, so that, that helped shape my mentality a little bit, where, you know, it's okay to not do certain things, like, you know, and it's okay for me to say that in my songs and tell other young people, nah, I don't do that, do the right thing, but somebody did that for me. You know, the older drug dealers in the neighborhood used to tell me, nah, you can't sell drugs. Y'all got music, you go back in the studio, you're not out there doing it, I ain't gonna let you do that, you know? And so all of that type of stuff affected our music and the style of music and how we, you know, write our lyrics and, um, you know, just, just a lot of negativity a lot of negativity was going on around us. A lot of crime, a lot of shootings, drug dealings, a lot of craziness, you know, my pain. So it all just came out. Like, it just came out in the lyrics. It came out in the style of the beats that we were producing. 
you could just hear it, like what we were going through. You know what I mean? Um, and we had a lot of, we experienced a lot of, you know, deaths around us. A lot of friends got murdered, and um, during the time I was making these albums, you know what I mean? So a lot of that, you know, it just went into the lyrics, man. You know, the things that I was just learning growing up. Um, and in Long Island, where I'm from, they had like the gods and the earths. You know, that was like the cool thing. The older dudes was outside selling drugs. They was like learning knowledge of self, the 120 lessons and all that type of stuff. So I was attracted to that also, you know, and it made me want to learn like about history and, my, and black history and, you know, history of religions and people and cultures and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so that also, you know, helped shape, you know, the way I write my songs and, and the stuff that I talk about was growing up around that stuff, like, you know, and it helped me along my way and, and inspired me to read more and learn more and, you know, help my lyrics become more, uh, you know, intelligent. Uh, I just have two quick questions for you. Number one, in your opinion, how do you think a black man can win in America? And where's the after party at? <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> the, the black man can win, right, by learning uh, knowledge of self, right, where we from, our culture, our people, and then once you do that, once you learn yourself and your family and where your culture's from, then you learn other people's cultures and where they're from and why they do what they do and how they start. And like just learning the history and origin of things, it always, you know, it gives you a clear head and yeah, like sharp mind, like, you know, so you have a better understanding of the world and you have a better respect for other cultures and people and their beliefs and, you know, their uh, way of life and all that. So it's not just about, you know, learning yourself, it's about, you know, just learning more about the world. But you have to start with yourself. You know what I mean? You have to solve it yourself. So, because that would be the most interesting thing for you to learn, I would say, is yourself and your history and your people and where you're from and how to get here, you know what I mean? And how everything started and stuff like that. Um, that's what I did, you know, and that, that helped me a lot. Like, I started with the 120 lessons from the Nation of Islam, the Five Percenters, and my mother bought me uh, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 16. That was my birthday gift. And because she's seen I was reading a lot about the 120 lessons and 5% nation and stuff. So I, I read Ma Malcolm X's book and I was interested in that because Malcolm started as this criminal, rough guy, he was a pimp. And then he went to jail, changed his life. He, he found the nation of Islam and helped him change his life. You know, um, he started learning about history and politics and all that type of stuff. And then he went to Mecca, right? And he seen all the people, different races, cultures, white people praying with black people, and they was all praying together. And that changed him. That changed his mind of how what he was learning from the Nation of Islam, you know? Because um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of those teachings of like the white man is the devil and all that type of stuff, and he learned that that's not necessarily true. You know what I mean? There's devils come in all shades and colors, you know what I mean? Anybody can get devil. A devil is just your energy. It's in positive. Or, or negative energy, you know. The, the devil to me is somebody that's very negative, evil person, you know, and that and that could be any race of people, you know what I mean? So I learned that from reading Malcolm X book. And um, then from reading that, I just started, I, w I was more interested in learning about other cultures and other things and just learning how to deal with people and, and, um, and, and, and uh, just getting the more reading, you're just learning about history and politics and health and everything, like, and, and from doing that, that just, you know, helped expand my mind, and I started seeing it helping me write my lyrics, because I was learning words that I never knew before, I was learning things I never knew before, and it was just like, expanding my, you know, vocabulary Well, it trickled down to me, so thank you. Yeah, man, thank you. The after party. Oh, yeah, the after party. <laughs> <laughs> after party at MIT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to go back to what you were saying about um, kids out of your neighborhood getting caught up for having, you know, small amounts of drugs. And, um, I mean, as you probably know, a lot of people in jail right now are in jail because of uh, nonviolent drug crimes. And I was wondering what you were thinking about, um, about the uh, prison industry 
and how it relates to the, the war on drugs right now? Yeah, I mean, the way it's set up right now, it's like, like I was saying earlier, like, I had learned from, from doing research and stuff like that, like, you know, when crack first came out and stuff like that, they started making these new laws where if you get caught with a piece of crack, you know, you're going, you're getting severe time and mandatory minimums and all this. And, and it, it seemed like they was, you know, they did that to target the, the black neighborhoods and the Latino, the, under, the, the underprivileged and poverty stricken neighborhoods because those are easy busts and make them easy arrests and they fill those jail systems up. So I started, you know, when I learned that, I was like, wow, there's a, there's a lot of racism involved with that. But then, you know, I also learned that this is a business. You know what I mean? This is a business to fill that jail up. So they don't really care what color you are. You get caught with some drugs, they're trying to fill that <coughs> building up with inmates. You know what I mean? But um, they definitely, it's definitely a racial issue. It's definitely race involved, uh, very much so. You know, very much so. And then, and um, I, I slowly am seeing it changed a little bit, like racial issues, like I could see it firsthand, like just dealing with people, but I also see that there's a lot of that mentality still stuck inside of people that needs to change, you know what I mean? But yeah, the um the laws that they got right now, like Obama and the Obama administration, they trying to do the you know, the prison reform laws where they're trying to change those laws right there and maybe uh people that's locked up doing severe time, they cut their sentences down and they can come home a little earlier. I see them trying to do that right now, and it seems like a good thing what they're trying to do. Like you know what I mean? So hopefully they'll get that done. You know, um, the uh, what is it? The uh, former Attorney General Holder, Obama, and um, you know they have this whole plan on. I guess before he leaves the office or whatever, he's going to help you know pass these laws or whatever, and, and help get people out and change the law, the drug laws. You know, because you got people locked up doing 20 or life sentence for some drugs, and then you got a rapist, child molester, just doing six, seven years and coming right home. Like, that's incredible. Like, you know, that's that's kind of crazy, like, you know? And, um, yeah, I definitely think that a lot of it was to lock a lot of black people up, you know what I mean? And, and it's not fear, racism, and, you know, um, but also, I also think a lot of it was just to fill that jail with whoever, whatever color you are, you need to fill that jail because that's a business. You know, it's a serious business too. And, and I was looking at some statistics and from like the 1920s to now, it's like the percentage that the jail rate went up, the inmate is like incredible, like thousands of percent probably, like it just skyrocketed, like it's a super business right now. Super business. And like I said, well, one of my friends from the industry actually stepped to me and tried to help me, tried to get me to invest with him in these private pr prisons that they were starting to build. Like, they were actually building the prisons, and they wanted me to put money up with them. I'm like, yo, well, nah, I'm not doing that. I don't want nothing to do with that, dog. You know what I mean? I don't want nothing to do with that. So I always remember that, because now I think more about the prison system, and I've been through it, and I always remember, I always go back to that time and they had to try to get me to invest in these prisons. And I was like, wow, that's a real thing. And I actually know people that's doing it. You know what I mean? Like, crazy. Thank you. There's something in the back of that. <laughs> With uh, everything going on in uh, San Bernardino, and actually, <coughs> you got locked up for having a gun. I don't think that was your first time being mm. caught with a gun. Yeah. What are your opinions now on gun control? Um, my opinions on gun control is that it definitely needs to be tougher laws for like how people get guns and like you know who should have them and stuff like that. How easy it is to get them, but I feel that people, uh, the American people shouldn't lose their right to bear arms. Like, you, I, I, I definitely think that people should have guns in the house to protect their house, their family, to protect their business, you know. Um, there should be definitely, uh, we shouldn't lose our rights, you know, to have our guns. And I know that there's, there's certain things that are happening there. They're trying to take those rights from us. What's you your know? response to, you know, the main argument that more guns, means that there's just more situations that are going to end up in somebody getting shot, whereas without a gun it would just be, you know, a fight that wouldn't be fatal. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, that's definitely a good argument, man. I, I definitely think that there needs to be strict, tough laws to get guns. 
You know what I mean? And certain people just shouldn't be having guns. Like, shouldn't be walking around with guns in the street and stuff like that. Like, you know, um, but um, as far as like having a shotgun and a rifle or whatever to protect your, your home, your business, your family, like, I believe in that. I don't think those rights should ever get taken from us. Like, those are rights, you know what I mean, from the beginning of this country that protect us from a tyrannical government, you know what I mean? It's just trying to over those people, like, you know what I mean, take control of the people. And I, I believe that we need that to stay in place. Real power of people. Yeah, for real. Like, you know, um, um, a lot of people might get that far fetched. you know what I mean? Like, like the, the government in place like that, that would do that to people, but um, yeah, that, that law was put there for that reason. Mm -hmm. So, it's not that far fetched. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I'm on the juvenile, um Department, I'm in the juvenile department, and you mentioned that you were incarcerated with a 20 year old, correct? Mm -hmm. um, what is some advice that you would give juvenile justice agencies to target this population either behind the walls or after they come out? Like, what are more mentoring, more uh, should we be behind the walls like four months, six months be uh, before they get out? Um, just <coughs> anything, just anything. Yeah, I definitely think there should be like mentoring programs like on the street. Um, for young, young kids, man, before they even get to the jail, the chance to get locked up, before they make a bad decision, they get locked up. Um, um, definitely, when they do get locked up, if they do get locked up, there should definitely be programs in place, like you said, before they get home, like way before they get home early, just sitting there mentoring them even during that time. Like, so they won't have to come back to jail or, you know, commit another crime and be back in jail. Um, <laughs> Tell you, when, when we were young, when we were first coming up, at home, uh, we used to do speaking at juvenile detention centers. We used to talk to the kids that were locked up for murder. Like, there was kids, little kids, like, you know, from like 10 to 16 years old. And we would just be in there talking to these kids. And it was just amazing hearing their stories. And you know, sometimes somebody got killed by a mistake or, you know, some, something small they wasn't thinking. And, um, it was hard for us to talk to the kids, like, you know, at first, it was just like, damn, you ain't here for a long time, like, and, you know, we out in the world making music, doing our thing, and then we came here trying to tell you the right thing to do, like, um, but it's definitely important, that's, that's like one of the most important things, is, is talking to the kids before it actually becomes a problem, you know what I mean, um, and talking to, even like, you know, young juveniles that's locked up before it, it, it becomes an adult, problem, like serious problem when they get older, like, um, that's definitely important. And I would like to get more involved with, like, definitely stuff like that. Please build USA, just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, creating programs or getting involved with other programs that's there, like, that's, that's important to me, is talking to kids. I love talking to kids and talking to them about diet and talking about health, you know, like, the attitude issue. Like, I have that issue with my son a lot. Like, I always tell him, he's my daughter, too. You know what I mean? I always tell them, because I always remember my attitude. When I was young, I had a terrible attitude. You know what I mean? And I always try to remind them, you can learn from me. You don't have to learn from your mistakes. You can learn from my mistakes. And you don't have to go through that. Just trust me when I tell you I'm your father. Like, I'm not going to tell you nothing wrong. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's like a big thing for me. I love talking to them about that. And, and it's also an issue. Like, I find myself having to keep repeating myself, repeating myself, until he finally gets it. You know what I mean? So I know how that, that's like a struggle, and that's a hard one. And that's one of the most important ones. Well, yeah, so this has to be our last question. Please. Hi. My name's Laura. How you doing? Um, I'm a second grade teacher in Boston. And I know that a lot of states, New York being one of them, uses um, third grade reading levels as a way to actually predict the amount of beds that prisons are going to need. And the school to prison pipeline is just um, increasing. And I'm wondering just if you could speak on your own experience um, in elementary school, in the public schools in New York, whether positive, negative, what your perception of it was, and how that influenced you. Um. Well, I went to elementary school in Long Island. I went to a good elementary school. My grandmother actually, you know, she paid me for, to go to private school. So I went to elementary school. In the elementary school, it was called, uh, it was called uh, Malvern. It was in Malvern in, in Long Island. I'm trying to think of the exact name of the school. I think it was Malvern, though. But um, me going to that school, it, it, it helped me, um, you know, uh, just socialize with 
other races, kids, white kids, black kids, you know, Chinese kids, different cultures, different races in there. And it helped me to get along and learn how to get along with other people, like, you know what I mean? Um, and it was, it was actually a great school. It was like one of the best schools probably out there, the elementary school. Um, now, I had friends that went to elementary school in Queens and dropped out of elementary school and started some crap, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, just from from uh, them telling me about their experiences and what they was going through, it was like the schools in Queens and, and like certain schools in Brooklyn and boroughs and stuff like that. This is like tough. It's tough. As little kids, it's tough. So you know, there's a lot of fights and stuff like that. Little kids pick on you because of what you're wearing and stuff like that. But um, as far as like experiencing myself firsthand, I, I couldn't even really tell you. Like you know. Was, was my experience because I had a good one going to elementary school. This is a really inspirational talk and we can't thank you enough. Thanks. Thank y'all for having me.